Well, my dad was teaching me how to learn to drive at a really early age. It was well before I was the age 16. He would always let me drive his work truck around. If he was on a job site or uh, doing some work out somewhere, he would, he would let me drive this massive work truck around. It was a manual, a stick shift, and he wanted me, he said, that's the way you're going to learn how to drive, is learning how to drive a stick shift. And he would allow me to drive this massive work truck around. I rem- remember one Saturday, he was working at the end of a long gravel road. And at the end of this long gravel road, uh, the road narrowed into a one-lane bridge. And he took me out there before he let me drive. I'm going to practice driving while I go do this. You, you practice and you can go up down this road and turn around and go back. And he took me out there and he said, now, when you cross this bridge in this big truck, you have to get the tires lined up. I do not want to have to leave this job and come out here and pull you out of this ditch. And so I'm thinking, yeah, that's great. I get to drive. I get to practice driving. And there's no way I'm going to end up in this ditch at the end of the day. And I think you all know how the story ends already. The day started out fine, driving back and forth, shifting gears, getting the hang of it, slowing down, gearing down before I went across that bridge, making sure I was passing that bridge perfect and fine. And then as the day went on, You just get careless, you increase your speed, you begin to think that you have this down pat, and I went zooming across the creek, across that small bridge, and didn't even think about the fact that the left tire went off the side of the bridge, and there I went off into the creek, ran the truck off into the creek, and I walked up to my dad, and he just looked, at. he knew what had happened, because the truck was nowhere to be found, and there I was standing in front of him. Never said a word to me, just shook his head, went and got someone's tractor and pulled me out of the creek. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 is like that bridge. It's like that bridge in the book of James. And if you don't get this right, you're going to end up in the ditch. If you don't get this idea of faith and works right, if you don't get both wills right, on the bridge, you're going to end up in error, whether it's faith, one side of the bridge, or works, the other side of the bridge. And so what we've got to do today with this passage of Scripture is slow down and work through it very carefully. And I I do want you to, in your minds and heart, make sure you get this, because some of us come in, we come to this passage, we have preconceived notions, I got it, I understand it, but let's make sure that we understand, because if we get this wrong, it's more than just running off in a creek, it could be disaster for your faith. It could be disaster for understanding the gospel in your life. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul makes it very clear how a person is saved, how a person is justified, and it is by faith alone in Christ alone. You hear us say that around here when someone comes to join in our church. We want to make sure that they understand the gospel and that they understand the only way they can get to heaven, be justified, is through confidence in Christ's work in their place, his life and his death in their place. Paul says a man is not justified by works of the law. You cannot set out and say, I'm going to obey the law summarized in the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to become this perfect, righteous person so that God would accept me. No, Jesus is the only perfect, righteous person, and we believe in him. And Paul says, even we have believed in Jesus Christ so that we may be justified by faith in Christ. He is emphasizing this over and over in the book of Galatians, not by works of the law, since by works of the law, no flesh is justified. So Paul wants to be very clear in the book of Galatians, the only way you can be declared righteous and right before God is in Christ and trusting in what he has done and nothing you have done. You will only stand before God and be accepted by faith in Christ. And now what we do in this section of Scripture in the book of James is we unpack what that faith 
looks like. What does that faith look like? Faith that says it is only Christ and only in his cross and only in his resurrection and hoping in only in his kingdom. What does that look like? That faith, that confidence in Christ. Well, James begins by saying it's not word only faith. Notice verse 14. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? What good, what profit is it if someone just walks around and says, I believe, I have faith, I I believe even this gospel that you're talking about. I believe. I have faith in Christ. But they never do anything. It never leads to change. It never leads to works. What good is that? Now, when James begins to talk about works here, he's not talking in the same sense Paul is talking about when he's talking about law. He's talking about commandments. He's talking about traditions. He's talking about adding things like circumcision and festivals, the Jewish festivals to your faith, faith plus works. He is talking about what he has unpacked in the book so far, what it means to hear the word of God and do the word of God. What good is it if someone says they believe in Jesus and they don't live like Jesus? They don't have the wisdom that we've talked about through the book of James that loves and sacrifices and shows others mercy. What good is it if they don't suffer with joy? What good is it if you can't see any of those things in their life? And back to Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, he says, A man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Again, these traditions, commandments. Paul is speaking of a ladder that you would work up to get to God. James is talking about someone who has already been accepted by God and what that looks like. James is talking about what it means to be declared righteous But what men see, Paul is talking about what God sees when he talks about works of the law. But James anyway says that kind of faith, the faith that has no response, love, mercy, wisdom, can that faith save someone? Can that kind of faith, can that sort of faith, faith that says, I'm a Christian, yes, I mentally assent to those things. I know those things are true. Can that faith save him? Well, the answer for James is no. It's no. If your faith doesn't lead to anything else, a changed life, James is going to tell us, then you really don't have faith. He gives an example in verse 15. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, this is someone who is utterly helpless. This isn't someone who is saying, you know what? I'd like to eat out more. This isn't someone who says, I would like to dress more stylish. No, this is a person that you know and you see with your own eyes and, and they are nearly naked. They, they have no way to afford clothing. And they are in despair and they are hopeless and they, they will not survive if you do not help them. And James says, and if one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things for the body, what good is that? What good is that? His point is, what good are your words? Hey, brother, why don't you eat something? You look weak. Hey, why don't don't you go get some clothes on? What good is that? He says your words only are absolutely worthless. And that's what his point is. A faith that is word only, a claim to be a Christian, a claim to have faith, it is worthless. It is useless. It does nothing for you or anyone else. And he continues, he says, what good is that? And then verse 17, as we've already read, so also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Again, he gets back to this point, a word only, which actually is no faith, it's just words, 
Words by themselves are useless. Words that say, I have faith, they are empty, they are futile, without the works of love, mercy, and wisdom. But then he gets to the point, he says, that kind of faith is dead. And the word he uses here is barren, which calls to mind this idea that James has been talking about when he talks about a living faith that begins in our heart. When something is barren, it can't bring forth life. It will not bring forth life. It is dead. And he's, James is referring to a living faith that is alive, that brings forth fruit and deeds and life in the person who believes. And this is one reason we have to keep in context that James believes that faith is not dead but alive is he believes that it is a supernatural work of God in your heart. Remember in James chapter one, verse 18, what he says? Look at the scripture, James chapter one, verse 18. He says, of his own will, of his own grace, of his own mercy, he, God, the father of lights in context, brought forth, brought us forth by the word of truth, So when you became a Christian, something supernatural happened in your heart where God birthed, gave you new birth. This is what Jesus told Nicodemus. In order to get to heaven, you must be born again. You must be born from above. And so what God does in our hearts when we believe the gospel is he gives us new birth. He makes us a new creation. And notice how he does it. By the word of truth, the gospel is, as James would say in verse 19, is implanted in our hearts that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. God will ultimately make all things new, all things right. All things will be in submission and surrender to Jesus. And he begins that supernatural work in your heart when you believe the gospel. Something supernatural has happened. You haven't just agreed to some facts. You you haven't just become a part of a club on the outside that you take on certain values and traditions. There is something supernatural that has happened in your heart when you believe the gospel. The word of God, James would say, is like a seed implanted when you receive it by faith. And what that seed does, it doesn't lay dead. It doesn't lay dormant in your heart. It begins to grow and desires begin to change. Old dead roots that desired sin are pushed out by new desires that come from the gospel, the spirit of God. And what the spirit does is he begins to conform your life to the life of Christ by the word of God. And you begin to live like Jesus. This is a supernatural work that God does in us when we believe the gospel. And old patterns of self-centeredness are overwhelmed by sacrificial joy as you follow Jesus. This is a supernatural work that James is talking about. So when you think about faith, don't think about this is just something that I am doing. This is a transaction in my mind. This is just going through some motions. James wants us to back up in verse 18 and say, no, this is supernatural. And this is why your faith will not be dead. And this is why your faith will produce a new life a changed life, love, mercy, grace, as you relate to other people. So he continues. But if someone will say, you have faith and I have works, which someone says, hold on, James, aren't these, th- aren't these two different things? And, and what, if, what if I'm a person who I just really believe? I just really believe. And you may be someone who does a lot of good things. Don't we just have two different gifts from God? I'm a believer. You're a doer. And James says, okay, show me you believe. Beyond mere words, show me that you believe. And he says here, you can't. Notice he says, show me your faith apart from works. You can't do it. But the person who has genuine, true, living faith, he says, I will show you my faith by my works. 
He says, a person can't just claim, I have faith out of nowhere and and it not bring about change in their life. He says, no, no, when you believe, notice what happens. Your faith produces works. And this is very important, this last part of verse 18. I will show, I will display. Remember throughout James, your faith is being proven even when you suffer. It is being tested as true. My faith will be displayed and tested as true by my works. Notice it, this is works by faith or works that come from faith or works through faith. Faith is seen by works. This is not faith or works. J- James says you can't separate the two. They come in one package. Not faith and works or faith plus works. This is works that come by faith. It's faith that produce works. I will show you my faith by my works. Notice he continues. He says, I'm going to give you another example of what word only faith looks like, just claiming to have faith. He says, if you believe that God is one, you do well. That's a good thing. And he begins to unpack the basics of Jewish, the Jewish faith, Jewish theology, the Shema, Hero Israel, our Lord is one. You cannot believe in Yahweh unless you believe he is one God and the God. And so you believe that, that's good. That, that, that you do well, you're off to a good start. But he says, I wanna warn you of something. Even the demons believe that and shudder. The demons, when they saw the Lord Jesus Christ, they believed he was the one God of the Old Testament. They walked up to Jesus and they said, are you the holy one of God who has come to destroy us? Demons understood who Jesus was when the people around him had no clue who he was. They had better theology than the disciples. And there are demons present here today that know more about God than you do. The demons present that we can't see in this room have better theology than you and I. Why? They see things on a larger scale that we can't see. And they know exactly who Jesus Christ is. And they know exactly what he's done. And here James says they shudder in fear. They are scared to death of him. But the next line of the Shema is what? The Lord your God is one. And what does that require of you? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The demons have good theology, but they don't love God. The demons have good theology, and they shudder in fear, but they don't love their neighbor. And so the question here for us is, do you have demonic faith? Do you have good theology? You you could unpack our doctrinal statement backward and forward. You may know it better than I do. That doesn't mean anything. You may be able to unpack this passage of Scripture better than anybody in the room. You may be able to tell me how it, 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 we're justified by faith alone in Christ alone, but that's going to result in a changed life. And let me give you some illustrations and unpack it for you. That's good theology, but does it do anything in your life? Does that faith cause you to love God more and love your neighbor as yourself? Because genuine faith produces that in our life. Even the demons believe and shudder, but they do not have genuine saving faith. And so he says, verse 20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? What he says here is, do you need any more proof than just claiming to be a Christian, claiming to have faith, and not doing anything is stupid? Do you need any more proof than the demons? Because the demons believe and understand more about God than you do but they reject it and they, they're, they're selfish. They, they don't live for the purposes of God. Do you have demonic faith? He says, do you want to be shown any more examples that faith apart from works is useless? Look at the last verse or word of verse 20. This word useless, it means, it means idle. It means it's not working. 
And so what, what James wants to summarize here is faith without works doesn't work before God. It's useless. It does nothing for you. And even the demons have that faith. His point again is faith that doesn't lead to works doesn't save. But he's going to give us some more examples. And he begins with the example of Abraham. And he's going to talk about Abraham and Rahab, a Jew and a Canaanite prostitute. And he says, you want to see genuine faith? You can look at our father Abraham and you can look at Rahab, a prostitute, and you will see what faith looks like and faith acts on God's promises. Notice verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now this is where we get off track. This is where one tire goes off the road and we crash. What does he mean here? He contradicts the whole Bible here. What is he talking about? He was justified by works. Notice he points to a specific moment when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. And he says, you see that faith was active all along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. Faith was made full by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Now to understand these three verses, we have to go backwards because these three verses happen out of order than when they occur in the book of Genesis. And so to to understand, to zero in, we have to go backwards. What happened first? Verse 23. 23 resulted into what happened in verse 22, which results into what happened in 21. But what happened in verse 23? In Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abram land, seed, and blessing. He chose this man, Abram, who was a moon worshiper in the land of Ur. And he says, I'm going to make from you a great nation. I'm going to make from you a great nation that will bless all other nations. And he promised to Abraham that, that, that from him, the Messiah would eventually come. And this moon worshiper idolater believed God. And in verse 23, we see he believed and he was counted as righteous. This was in the scripture in Genesis chapter 15. He was credited with righteousness. And this is the same thing that Paul says happened when you believed the gospel and you were justified. When you believed in Christ, you were declared righteous because of what Christ did. The same thing happened to Abraham. Abraham was in the Old Testament and God gave him the promise of the Messiah coming and he looked forward and he believed God would bring about this Messiah through him. And when he did, God credited him with righteousness. Abraham was justified in Genesis chapter 15. Before God, he was declared righteous. And so what happened from his faith? Well, he left Ur. And in verse 22, we see here his faith was active all along. He had the promise of God and he continued to cling to the promise of God. He possessed land. Did did Abraham turn into a perfect person? No, he was a liar. He did not always trust God perfectly. At one point, he tries to bring about the promises of God through his slave, And yet he's still clinging to that promise that God's going to do something. And James says faith is active all along until verse 22. Notice he says his faith was completed. His faith was so full of good works because he so trusted God. When we get back to verse 21, he was justified by his works. What was justified? His faith, that he was a man of faith, was proven when God said, okay, Here's your son Isaac at 100 years old through his barren wife, Sarah. Here he is. Now what I want you to do with Isaac is I want you to take and sacrifice him on the altar. At that point in Abraham's life, he believed God so much. He had seen God do everything he said. His faith had been working all along that he got to that point. And he, Hebrew says, he believed God would raise the dead if he had to, to bring about the promise. And he was willing to put his son on the altar. And God brought a ram in the thicket that was used for sacrifice instead of Isaac. But what was justified in verse 21? 
Abraham's faith was justified. His faith was proven true. A faith that he was reckoned righteous, he was accepted, but he continued to live by faith to that moment he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. And so we see verse 21 proved or justified what happened in verse 23. And we see the context of this word justified. He was justified before God, and then he was justified. He was proven true before men. We read about his faith. And so next we see verse 24. He summarizes, you see that a person is justified by works and not, notice, faith alone. He doesn't say works alone. He says faith alone. This faith leads to those kind of works. J.I. Packer summarizes it this way. He says, by faith alone we are justified, but faith will never be alone. The type of faith and confidence it takes to believe the gospel and trust in the gospel will lead to a life of faith and it will be full of works, love, sacrifice, and risk, which we also see in Rahab, verse 25. And in the same way also, Rahab the prostitute was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. As Israel was overtaking the promised land, they sent in spies to Jericho. And these spies ended up finding lodging with a Canaanite prostitute who we learn later believed in Yahweh, believed in the promises of God. And that's why she takes these men in and she protects them and she assists them and she aids them on an escape. And then when Israel comes in and overtakes the land, she is rescued. Why is she rescued? Because of her faith that the, that the Lord will fulfill his promises to his people and wipe out his enemies. Her faith is proven in that she risked her life for those spies. And so she believes in the promises of God. And what does she do about it? She risked her life. Faith will not be alone. It will be proven by works. And so when you read the words here, justified by works, You should also understand what he is talking about here is faith is being justified. Faith is being proven by the works that it displays. And he says in verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. He says faith is is like a body and you may have a shell, flesh, But if you don't have the spirit, you don't have who you are on the inside, it's useless. It's a shell. It's dead. He says, so when you think about faith, you think about a confidence in God, a confidence in his goodness. And if you genuinely are confident in God's goodness because of the gospel, you will act on it. You won't just say, I believe that. You won't just understand mentally those things are true. You will act on it, just like Abraham and just like Rahab. Your faith will be proven true. And so you're here today and you're like, some of you are like, my goodness, do I have a living faith? Do I believe these things? How do I know they're true? Am I living by faith? That, we have to stop right now. <laughs> Before we move forward, and that is the question for everybody. Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe these things are true? Or are you holding a dead body of faith that you will present to God that is useless? Do you believe? Are you trusting in Christ alone? Because that is the first step. Some of you in this moment are thinking, I got to get to work. I said, I believe this. And in your mind, you're thinking, I need to write down a list of things that I need to do. Stop it right now. Stop it. Stop with your list. Set it aside because you're missing the point. What is the emphasis through the whole passage? Faith, 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 faith. The reality is you could leave here today and do a lot of good things and still go to hell. You could leave here today and come up with your list of things and it will not save you. And by the way, if you come up with your list of things apart from faith in Christ, it will not last. 
It won't last, and it certainly won't last before God. So what do you need to do? You need to ask the question, do I believe in Christ alone? Do I genuinely trust in Christ alone? Is all my confidence in Christ alone? Have I been justified by faith in Christ alone? You are first and foremost saved by the works of Christ. His death in your place for your sins. His perfect life for you that you could never live, that he lived for you. You are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. And that happens, as James said, by God's grace alone. But it is only in Christ alone. You are declared as if you have never sinned and always obeyed when you believe in Jesus. But Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. If you genuinely believe in Christ, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. God has done this. It is a gift of God. This salvation is a gift of God. Even the faith that you received is a gift from God. And you have not been saved, notice the text, as a result of works. Your works that come from faith don't save you. If that were true, you could boast in what you do. But no one will be able to boast for God. For we are his workmanship. Notice that. When he created faith in you, he did so for a purpose. That you would be a trophy, a masterpiece that you would live like Jesus in the world and shine, as we read in James, from the Father of lights who has birthed you as a new creation. His workmanship, but notice the faith you have, you were given, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. He rescued you, he gave you faith so you would live it out, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's why God saved you. It's in Christ alone, but he saved you so you would walk with Christ alone. And for the person who is, he says here, walking by faith, you will produce good works. That will come from your life. And it won't be some grit. I got to get to work. It won't be something you just feel guilty about. It will naturally flow from faith. And James has explained that throughout the whole book. What do these works look like? Because I know that's what some of you are thinking. Okay, faith in Christ alone, justified in Christ. What does it look like? Well, Paul says it's certainly not the Old Testament law, applying it to your life, working up a ladder. But let's review James real quick. Remember, we're on the bridge and we got to get to the other side of the book of James. What would it look like for you today to trust in God's goodness and his righteousness and his cross? What would it mean for you to have full confidence in the gospel? What would that look like in your life? For some of you, that faith is going to lead today to choose to suffer with joy. That is the work God has prepared for you. That is the work he has laid out for you. That is why you are going through a very difficult trial right now, is that you would choose joy. Remember the anguish and the pain and the frustration of of trials that we talked about in James. Today, by faith, not by a work, by faith, you would set joy on on the balance as a counterweight, and you would say, God is good. I believe God is good, and he is making me like Jesus. And one of the works that would come from that faith today is you would stand before God today and say, in this difficult, hard circumstance, God, teach me what it would mean for me to suffer like Jesus. That comes from genuine faith. When we talked about that, some of us were scandalized. How in the midst of suffering do I say, don't give me what I want. Here's my heart's desire, But whatever you give me, God, make me like Jesus. How does that happen? It only happens by faith in the supernatural work of God. And that is out for some of us here today. 
For some of us, it means turning from the temporariness of this world to the reward that we have in the kingdom. James talks about how this life is a vapor and we are clinging to things that are going to rust and they're going to destroy. And that is what is making us miserable because as those things waste away, our life, our bodies, the things that we love in this world, they go away as we cling to them with all of our confidence and all of our soul. We are drifting away and we are being taken away. True faith says, I got something better Jesus than anything this world has to offer. And that is the work that God has prepared for some of you today to walk in by faith, to say these things are a vapor and they're gone and I can't cling to them, but I have a kingdom because of the cross and because of his righteousness and because of the resurrection. And by faith, I'm going to live for this kingdom, the kingdom that's coming and not the kingdom that is wasting away. You got to work that out in your own life. There are thousands of ways that that work is produced in this room right now where you by faith choose that. By faith, stop trusting in what sin says will make you happy and understand and believe as James has said, when we hear and do the word of God, obeying Jesus is what will bring joy. Remember when James says that sin brings about death and it kills you? Some of you don't believe that's true. Some of you right now are believing that sin will make you happy. The first rule in my house is sin makes you stupid. And we're all stupid on some level. And then the next statement is, and it'll kill you. It will ruin your life. And some of you don't believe that. And so the answer is not get to work. It's by faith, believe God is better and he's proving it at the cross and I'm clinging to the cross. And so I'm gonna believe that following Jesus is better. And so what that means, James has told us, is repenting of self-centered desires and obeying the word of God that is in our heart and sacrificing and giving and bridling our tongue. By faith, bridle your tongue. Some of us are trying to do that by grit and it ain't working. No, you believe that God has loved you and so you're gonna love others by the way that you speak to them and the way you talk to them and so you're gonna encourage them and you're gonna share the gospel with them. That is a work God has prepared that you should walk in by faith. By faith, love those who are inconvenient to love and love those who are invisible in our culture, the poor, the orphan, the widow. Those are works that we walk into by faith. By faith, we obey the law of love. We love our enemies. There are are people in your life right now that you are seething against because they're on the other side of the aisle for a social issue and you loathe them and you hate them. There are people in your neighborhood and you drive by their house and, and, and you're, you think, how in the world could I ever love them? By faith in a gospel that says you were once God's enemy and he loved you. That's the kind of faith that God produces in our life and it makes no sense to the world around us. Why would you step into someone's life who may even hate you and despise you and love them and forgive them and show them mercy You you can only do it by faith. You're not going to find the grit inside of you. It begins by faith, the love, forgiveness, and mercy that James has talked about throughout the book. Those are the works. Not showing partiality, but embracing mercy. Go back this week and read the first two chapters of the book of James. And just when you get to a point, yeah, I'm struggling with this. This is hard. You want to know what God is calling you to do by faith? And it's different all across the room. This is why we don't get to the end of every sermon and I give you a list of things to do this week. Because you would go out and do that list and you would say, I'm doing good. And then there may be things on the list that you never have to come face to face with. It's different for everybody in this room what God is calling you to. But I know one thing. For those who believe in Christ alone, for those who understand that it is by grace alone, in Christ alone, these things will flow from our life. Love, mercy, joy, endurance, repentance, sacrifice, obedience, speech full of grace and mercy. What good is faith 
that just says, I have faith. May that not be so of anyone in this room today. May we all cling to Christ and him alone.